he excused himself, went upstairs, sent out a department email basically saying his goodbyes, and then died. You are a warrior. Look out of you are the very best your nation has to offer. They're asking you to lead. Five. We need a bear cat. It's up to us. So 133. I need somebody that's got a visual of where the shooter is. You must be sound in mind, body, and spirit. 42, where is the officer down? I have a rescue helicopter that wants to land and help. This is the podcast that will make you the one. The one that will bring everyone back. Trouble, we have shot fired, shot fired. Give me back up now. Because no one else is coming. We're going to have an officer shot. An officer shot. 100 block of East Street. Suspect is down. Suspect is down. This is the squad room. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Squad Room Podcast, where we learn how to serve, strive, and succeed in our challenging careers as first responders. On the show, we cover the tactics and strategies you can use to lead with vision, honor your oath, and take care of your mind and your body, and be the one in someone else's time of need. My name is Garrett Tesla. I'm a full-time sergeant for a sheriff's office in Southern California, and I am on a mission to build a world where first responders wake up inspired, feel confident at work, and go home safe knowing they've spent their time in a worthy cause. Before we get to our guest, I want to remind you of a few things. First... If you're on social media, make sure you're following us at The Squad Room and that you've liked our Facebook page. And while you're there on Facebook, make sure you join our Facebook group. Just search The Squad Room group to join. But most importantly is that you head over to thesquadroom.net and get signed up for our mailing list. People on that list get exclusive access to some free resource downloads, and I send out content there that's exclusive to that list. So don't miss out on something that can help you in your life or your job and join our list at thesquadroom.net. All right, my guest today is Lorenzo Glenn. Lorenzo is a lieutenant for the Anaheim Police Department, California. If you're not familiar with Anaheim, it's the epicenter of Disneyland. There's Angel Stadium. There's the Honda Arena. It's a a large uh, agency with an obvious huge tourist uh, base. Lorenzo is currently in charge of the Air Operations Unit and the Peer Support Team. And not only that, he's the current president of the Public Safety Peer Support Association. Their annual conference is coming up in just a few months here. Lorenzo has over over 30 years in law enforcement experience, and we got connected through Nick Wilson of the Resiliency Project, and he's been on the show as well. And it's uh, it's an interesting story. But Lorenzo uh, has done time in patrol, gangs, narcotics, auto theft, internal affairs, the tourist-oriented policing detail, Community services, cops for kids. He was promoted to lieutenant in 2015. He's been a watch commander, traffic commander, a district commander, in charge of several different uh, teams, uh, including the psychiatric emergency response team. Uh, he currently runs the detention and air support facilities. He has a BA in sociology from the University of Montana, a master's from Cal State Long Beach in emergency services administration. He's credited with starting the Anaheim Police Department's peer support team in 2012, and he's a very, very influential and uh, important person in the peer support world because of his work with the Public Safety Peer Support Association. So here's how the how our conversation came about, though. So Nick Wilson from the Resiliency Project, uh, I love Nick. Uh, we talk regularly, and he's become uh, a dear friend since uh, having him on the show. And he mentioned that I need to talk to Lorenzo. I said, Okay, why? Well, when Nick was a cop, uh, he was best friends or very close friends anyway with Anaheim PD officer Derek Trusk. And October and, and on October 8th, 2017, Officer Trusk took his own life. One of hundreds of officer one of hundreds of officers to do so uh, that year. Uh, and at the time he committed suicide, Lorenzo Glenn was his supervisor. So on this episode, Lorenzo talks very openly and honestly about the warning signs that they missed and that he missed as the immediate supervisor and what could have been done to possibly save Derek, if that was even possible, and how you can implement some of these lessons to prevent a tragedy from occurring at your own department. Lorenzo is a fantastic law enforcement leader, and his honesty and willingness to come on this show and talk about the lessons he learned is a real testament to his character and his efforts in the peer support realm. All right, before we get to uh, the conversation with Lorenzo, though, I want to thank our sponsors for this episode, all right? You know, when we think of the equipment that we carry with us on our person, we often assume that it's our sidearm that's the most important. 
but I disagree. Sure, it's important, of course, but think about how important your radio is and how often you use that versus how often you use your firearm out in the field. Statistically, you're more likely to go your entire career without firing your sidearm. However, you won't go more than a few minutes in patrol before you use your radio. It's literally your lifeline to the outside world. It's how you call for help, set up a perimeter, request an ambulance, or maybe a supervisor. And think about it. If you end up using your sidearm on duty, it's very likely that the next thing you'll use is your radio to tell dispatch shots fired. Our radios are incredibly important to our jobs, and to help keep us and our partners safe, it's important to make sure you're using quality equipment. You can't control the quality of the radio that you were issued, but we can often control control some of the accessories we use that might make us safer. I'm proud that Comgear Supply is a sponsor of this episode. Head over to comgearsupply.com, and you will see their massive inventory of microphones, earpieces, speakers, batteries, headsets, push-to-talk sets, and everything else you need to stay in comms and stay safe. Their customer service team will help you make sure you get the right accessories compatible compatible with your system. Now, here's the cool part about Comgear Supply and why I'm proud to work with them. They have a line of duty protection warranty on many of their products. If your gear ever breaks in the line of duty, they'll replace it for you. And prices are tax-free, and it's always free shipping on orders inside the U.S. and even into some parts of Canada. Definitely go check out their braided cable earpiece kits. I can't tell you how many earpiece kits I broke in, uh, I broke during my career or that frayed or I pinched a cable and they snapped. And that was before I knew about Common Gear Supply. These braided cables are so much more resistant than regular rubber cables. Go to CommonGearSupply.com and use the coupon code the Squad Room to get 10% off your order. Make sure you follow them on Instagram at Common Gear Supply and let them know that you appreciate their support of this show. This episode is also sponsored by Hard to Kill Fitness. You know, this current pandemic we're in has obviously changed the game and how we manage our fitness and our health with gyms across the world shutting down again and fresh produce in short supply again. We really have to take ownership of our routines when it comes to our fitness. A lot of you have been left scrambling to replace your gym routine with something you can do at home. Others of you might have already have a home gym like like I do, but uh, are looking for something more structured that you can set you up for success. Well, this episode is also sponsored by Hard to Kill Fitness, and I think they have a solution to a problem of staring at the whiteboard. Hard to Kill is run by a team of military and active duty police officers, uh, military veterans and active duty police officers who offer simple yet highly effective and proven functional training workouts that you can do at home or at the gym. Their routines focus on basic equipment and fundamental movements so you don't have to learn how to do Olympic lifts or complex movements. Hard to Kill Fitness develops workouts specifically for the demands of the military and first responder communities, and their goal is to prepare you physically and mentally for the challenges we all face in the streets. Each workout comes with a progressive path uh, that builds upon the previous work that you've been doing. It comes with a PDF with detailed descriptions of the movements of each workout tips on mindset and more. You also get access to the private Facebook group and you can interact with the coaches there or by email or by Instagram. So check them out at hardtokillfitness.co uh, as their website and Instagram is at hardtokill underscore fitness. All right, now we onto this episode with Lieutenant Lorenzo Glenn of the Anaheim Police Department. Lorenzo Glenn, welcome to the squad room. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, we got uh, connected together by Nick Wilson of the Resiliency Project. And, uh, it was Nick who, in almost every conversation I have with Nick, because we talk quite often, uh, he brings you up, uh, and he, you are held in such high esteem by someone I hold in such high esteem that I figured, well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta talk to you and, and pick your brain. And I think that the topic we're going to talk about today is, is, is certainly a heavy one and, um, you know, but it's necessary. And what I'm hoping we achieve for people today is that we, ha- that our conversation will help someone learn some skills so that they can have a courageous conversation with a friend or a coworker, or maybe someone they supervise and potentially, uh, you know, save someone's career or even, you know, save their life. So, you know, that not to put too fine of a point on it and not to make too uh, big of a challenge out of the next hour or so, but that's what I really want people to understand. And when this conversation, I think, will get difficult and heavy quickly. And I want people to work through that because I think there's going to be a lot of value in what they can learn from your experience and your story. Mm-hmm. So I just want to put that out uh, out at the beginning. But Lorenzo, do me a favor. 
uh, as we often do, because, you know, there's 800,000 cops out there. There's not many that are, quote unquote, famous. Tell us your story of how you got into law enforcement and where you're from. Well, OK, um, where I'm from, I'm from Orange County, California, uh, grew up in spent a little bit of time in Oceanside and then family moved to Santa Ana and then from Santa Ana to Fountain Valley. So um, spent majority of my life in Orange County. But ever since I was a small kid, ever since I can remember, it's always what I wanted to do, do two things, play sports and be in law enforcement. So um, that's the only thing I ever wanted to do. I watched all the cop shows, one out of 12, SWAT, all that stuff. Always looked up to um, law enforcement because of everything um, the uniform represents, everything the badge represents. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I wanted to protect those who couldn't protect themselves. And uh, when I finished playing football at University of Montana, came home in December of 1990. And in January, I was in the police academy. So uh, the second day of the police academy was hired by the city of Westminster, where I worked for two and a half years. And December of 1993, I came over to the city of Anaheim, where I currently still work. Um, but in, in those times, I always tell the stories that remember my first day, um, the watch commander calls me in the office and, and tells me, son, you're going to see a lot of bad things. You need to be professional. Don't take anything personal. Suck it up and move on. You understand? Yes, sir. That's what we did. You know what I mean? Didn't talk about your feelings. Didn't talk about the death, destruction, everything that we would see. And so what I would always bottle things up inside. And so I remember um, working at City Westminster and, and, and met a guy, uh, Tom Richards. Tom, um, I remember Tom because I think in 1989 or 1990, um, he was involved in an on-duty traffic collision where um, he was responding to assist uh, an officer. And it was rolling code three, went through an intersection and killed two women. And so that obviously had a lot of media uh, attention. And um, Tom was a, a probationary officer at the time. The city of Westminster uh, kept him. And I remember uh, meeting Tom and not knowing what I know now. Just thought he was very cold, very, you know what I mean? Um, he just was kind of standoffish. And I'd never understood why until years later, because everything that he went through. Mm -hmm. um, and so fast forward several, several years later, after Tom had retired from the city of Westminster, he got his doctorate degree and was helping officers um, in private practice, dealing with, you know, everything that officers deal with. So, so Tom went through, you know, all the training, all the education was helping officers. And then Tom ultimately died at his own hands on the, on the gravesite of one of the, the girls that he killed. And so that was that was very hard for not only myself, um, but the officers that worked at the city of Westminster. And Tom wasn't the only one in a short period of time that had died of their own hands. You know, uh, I remember Jerry Pate, one of the uh, um, officer Ken Pate um, that uh, I went on a ride along with. He died at his own hands as well. And so very short amount of time, I think they had three or four officers die uh, within a short period of time. And it really uh, hit that department hard because you're talking about an agency with under 100 sworn officers. And I remember talking to a friend of mine that still worked there and I wanted to check in with with him. And he gave us he gave me the typical, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I talked to my friend Jack and Coke every day. And so that's one of the things that we do to, you know, lessen the pain is we self-medicate, whether we self-medicate with alcohol, uh, you know, prescription drugs or, you know, sexual, you know, uh, stuff or gambling or something. We're always trying to self-medicate because we grew up in that that environment where you don't share weakness. And so those are things that, you know. I know it's tough to talk about, but these conversations are very necessary for us to overcome that stigma of, you know, seeking help. Yeah. You know, that's I mean, to think about an officer who went through something like that, speaking of Tom and, you know, then it's went 
and learned everything he could about it basically by becoming uh was he a psychologist or psychotherapist yes. uh-huh. so you you know i think that it's a good example here's someone who who went through something and then went and learned everything you could possibly learn about the subject and you would think that that person would then have the skill set to manage and navigate that successfully and yet even that person even that person with the phd can't couldn't do it on their own you know and i think i think we so often um assume that we have to do it on our own first of all or that we have to try first or that we'll never know enough in order to solve it for ourselves and here's a guy who pretty much knows everything about the topic and he couldn't he couldn't handle it either it just strikes me uh you know in that way you know to back up just a little bit too just to give people some context who aren't familiar with california orange county is you know just south of los angeles it's a massive county uh, it's, you're, you're at Anaheim PD. That's smack where Disneyland is and, and half of, uh, the happiest place on earth. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, but it's a very active city. Uh, and, um, uh, I know I, I have friends who work at the agency and, um, it is a, uh, it's a big, it's a big moving agency. How many officers do you have and what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, assignments have you had through your career? So, um, we're, we right now we're about 386 sworn at our you know height we're at 401 sworn mm-hmm. with another you know 250 through almost 300 civilian support staff so we're right about seven, 700 um and i'm sorry what was the other question oh, oh we'll, we'll cover the yeah mm-hmm. so obviously work patrol as an as an officer worked um street narcotics worked the gang detail um worked tourist oriented policing, worked internal affairs as a supervisor. Um, and then I think that the biggest um, thing that I was able to do is start a peer support program back in, in 2012. Um, mm. Currently right now I'm the Lieutenant overseeing our detention facility and air support, but I was also over our homeless um, outreach team in our West district um, as a commander as well. Which is a huge challenge down there. The, the homeless issue in, in Orange County is really at a crisis point. It is in a lot of places in the in the country, but certainly there and around Santa Ana and and that look in that area. So, I mean, you've you've had a, a a long career. You went to Anaheim in '93, and um, you mentioned the peer support team. And I, you know, Nick uh, always talks about um, his friend Derek. And I, I was hoping you could share the story, your version of that story with Derek and from your perspective, I don't mean your version, but your perspective of, of Derek Trusk, who was an officer with you, who was into watch was, uh, October 8th of 2017. And I think we can start there with this conversation. Sure. Um, so I met Derek, Derek was a lateral officer that came from Costa Mesa. Um, and then, you know, Derek was a typical family man, had two kids and a wife. Um, One day he decides to take his wife and and kids over to Angel Stadium uh, to see an Angel game. After the game, he wanted to get his, you know, son an autograph. So he's waiting for some some players after the game. Um, And then Derek was confronted by two two guys that uh, started to assault him in front of his wife and kids. his wife had to make the the um, decision to try and separate herself. Derek was armed at the time, and an officer-involved shooting occurred. Um, one of the gentlemen was, was shot and killed, but everything happened in front of his two young children and his wife. And so, um, and this happened right around 2009, 2010. So we didn't have a peer support program in place at that time. But I remember talking to Derek um, you know, several times throughout, you know, since that, that had happened to him and a lot of conversations, um, kind of, you know, started me on the path of thinking, um, what resources do we have as a department? What resources do we have as a city? So we're typical, like any, any, um, law enforcement agency where you have the employees assistance program that, uh, is offered by the city. But one of the things that I found, even 
through personal experience is that, you know, law enforcement, we are very guarded. You know, first responders are very guarded of who we trust and who we let into our, our world, right? So I remember going through uh, the EAP program, which is not very, you know, it wasn't user friendly, for instance. You right. know, sometimes you would call and the appointment would be three weeks, you know, two, three weeks later. But a lot of times when we get the courage of wanting to seek help, we're almost in crisis now. So we don't have the the luxury of waiting per se. And then when you do go, that person really doesn't understand our culture. And so when we go into a situation where we're guarded, you know what I mean? Or if we go in uniform, that person that is not comfortable with us in uniform or because they see a gun and a badge and it wasn't uncommon for somebody you know, to go in uniform, they'd be like, could you leave your weapon, you know, in the office or in the car or something like that. So that's already strike one, you know, probably strike two because it's, it's taken us so long to get this appointment. So um, I remember talking to Derek and Derek was struggling, uh, although he received some some help uh, with his with his family and things like that. He was still struggling because a lot of things that he was going through, he didn't have the courage to talk to his wife about. These are the things that I'm, I still see every night. I can't go to sleep. I can't get these images out of my mind because as the male figure in the household, we want to be strong for our family, right? So we want to protect our loved ones, but at the same time, we don't want to share with what's really going on in our life. So uh, several years later, uh, in 2012, um, when I started the, the peer support program and was seeking for, you know, peer supporters, Derek was one of the first people that I reached out to, you know, to be a part of the team. And so we got our team running, um, up and running a couple of weeks after the civil unrest here um, in the city of Anaheim after two officer-involved shootings that, that made national news. So it was very, it was something that our department needed. But what was um, challenging is I had to change the culture, not only within law enforcement, but our police department as well. Because it, it took me about a year, year and a half to really get the team up and running. Because like I said, we had to change that culture. But the most important thing that I wanted to um, come across to the team members is that we have to have the confidentiality. We cannot leak what was told between peer supporters unless somebody was a danger to themselves, committed a crime or something extraordinary, right? So when I met Dr. Nancy Bull back in 2010, um, that kind of changed you know, my life in a sense that I met her at a conference and she said, oh, you're from Anaheim. And she said, um, I had a, a person in my officer involved shooting class that's getting ready to retire after 25 years of service. And that person came up to her and said, the reason why I'm in this class, because I got in a shooting 25 years ago and never received help for it. And that was, that kind of struck me because of everything that I've went through, all the feelings that I've had, you know, 25 plus years in law enforcement, I was finally able to share some of that stuff you know, with, with Nancy and her team, and she's um, the, the owner of um, the Counseling Team International that uh, has phenomenal um, doctors that work with her that deal with first responders. So they know our culture. They know exactly how we think. And, you know, um, so um, in, in talking through Derek with, throughout the years, he started to, to spiral out of that. You know, um, and and so several years later, a couple of years later, um, I found out that Derek um, was involved in an extramarital affair. That um, it was kind of challenging for us because just the circumstances around it, and so he was suspended from the peer support team, but at the same time. Um, we kept an eye on him, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, 
we wanted him to take care of his personal um, uh, things that are going on in his personal life to give him that that time away. But um, I remember getting a phone call one particular night. Um, this person had called and said uh, Derek had, had attempted a suicide attempt. And so when that person brought this forward to me, I said, do you understand what you're asking me to do? You know, because now you, you know, have to ring the bell. Uh, because if we wanted to give Derek that opportunity um, to get some help. And so I remember um, talking to a captain who was in charge of, of our peer support team. We called Derek to his therapist's office. And the therapist gave Derek um, an option, either self-commit or she was going to commit him. Now, Derek had the, had the tough decision because if somebody, if you self-commit, that's one thing. But if you're committed, you know, placed on a 5150 hold, every officer knows what that means. And so Derek decided, okay, I will, I will self-commit. And this is this is a mistake that that we made as um, as a department, I think, uh, because the place that, where where Derek was taken was a place where we in law enforcement take any any one of our 5150s. It's not a, a place where a first responder should go, because it I, I think it really affected him negatively. And that really broke the trust because I remember, you know, going there with them thinking, you know, and, and I just didn't know, you know, what we know now there's places for first responders to go. So you're there with other first responders, if that makes sense. But yeah. uh, it, it wasn't a place that Derek should have gone. And so that really broke the trust. Um, but he and I still still spoke um, in the you know the days and weeks leading up to Derek's death. I remember um, a lot of uh, conversations because even members of the peer support team were concerned because we have a conference every year. I'm um, not sure if Nick shared this with you. The president of peer support. Uh, Public Safety Peer Support Association. And we have a, a, a conference every year in San Diego. Um, and I remember with, with our team, we were all concerned about Derek. Um, and then, you know, a few months later, Derek, you know, died at his own hands. But the day of Derek's death, he was surrounded with with friends. But I think one of the things that kind of let led Derek down this this path is that he had been drinking that night, which, you know, probably made it easier in a sense to to pull the trigger um, because people were downstairs and he what he what he excused himself, went upstairs, sent out a department email basically saying his goodbyes and then died. Um, and so I remember um, it really tore our department apart. You know what I mean? It really did. Um, but those are some of the things that I wanted to get across is that, all, yes, we we're all concerned, but there's got to be something better that we could have done for Derek. You know what I mean? There's places that we, sh we should have taken him that would hopefully would have cost him not to do it, but um, there, there are times where, you know, no matter what resources that, that somebody has, if they have made up their mind, they're going to make up their mind. But those are some of the things that, you know, I regret, you know, some of the things that I have to live with. But I want to make sure that people understand um, you don't have to go through it alone um, because there's a lot of agencies out there that maybe have never had to deal with a suicide and it's so only just a matter of time in my opinion um but those agencies don't have to go alone if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah 
you know, so you you said a couple things uh, about the early on interventions that really struck me, and this is because we're talking like twelve years ago now when you were st- starting to uh, when this when these first events happened, and then how you were about a decade ago still looking to start the peer support team, and and so I mean that's really progressive, you know, in the timeline of policing because like it's just. It's like now that most agencies are kind of looking at peer support. Some of them have had them for some amount of time, but this is quite some time ago that you were mindful of the, of this. What I have so many questions out of this, but I want to keep it, uh, you know, concise, but you you were, were you Derek's direct supervisor? No. Well, at one point I was, you know, in patrol, you know, but Mm -hmm. then I would move on, but you develop those friendships afterwards. So we had more than just a supervisor employee relationship. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what was it about his behavior? You said there were there were some there must have been the red flags that you picked up on that you were able to then translate into a conversation with them to at least try to intervene with them. But at the time was at least, you know, or not at least, but only EAP. But what were those things that kind of like, you know, those red flags that brought you brought up or you, that you saw in him? You know, just, uh, just our conversations. And I remember um, at Derek's funeral, Chief Snowden from, former chief from Costa Mesa that knew Derek, because that's where Derek came from. And he saw Derek several years later, you know, after Derek was here in the city of, in, a city of Anaheim, they ran into each other and Chief Snowden and Derek had this conversation, you know, a private conversation that um, Chief Snowden was able to share some of that at Derek's, you know, funeral. And and Chief re- specifically recalled, like, you know, Derek, something's not right with you. You, you. You've changed since you, you know, come over to Anaheim. And Derek shared with him the shooting that he um, got into um, in front of his, his family. And, you know, for, the, for that chief to pick that up, those are the conversations that, that we need to have, you know what I mean? Um, because it's interesting, um, I wrote a, a paper um, in command college, post command college, and it talks about the brain, you know, because Dr. Amons has a, a facility here in Orange County that, you know, did a lot of study on brain activity and PTSI, PTSD, um, because that's a traumatic brain injury. And so what if we had something in law enforcement, say you and I, day one, this is what our brain looks like, right? Day, you know, year five or after these critical incidents, this is what your brain looks like now. And how that, you know, how they would be able to treat Lorenzo Glenn or, or Garrett in regards to this is what your brain is, not just, you know, this is what we think is, is causing it. Have these, you know, resources specific to what our brain is, mm-hmm. you know, something that I think that would, would change, change the game. I think that would be, yeah, yeah, you know, we work, we're all fact, we're all fact-based, right? We all yes. deal in facts and evidence and hard evidence and, uh, the last thing we all like to have as an input is the emotion, right? And so yeah. much of our diagnosis or uh, the input from a therapist or the input from friends is based on emotion. But I, I think you're right. If we are able to show hard evidence, which there is, you know, it's just out of reach of most of us. The, the hard evidence that these kinds of traumas do cause a brain injury. Um, the vast majority of those can be rehabilitated, but you have to know what you're dealing with. Right? Yes. What, you know, you're a lieutenant now. Obviously, that means you were a sergeant at some point and possibly even, you know, a corporal in that rank structure that we all have. What advice do you have for a sergeant or a, another lieutenant who feels like they have an officer that is struggling? You know, and those warning signs, of course, could be, you know, lots of sick calls or, you know, decreased activity at work or irritability or the stepping out, uh, that kind of, act, you know, those high risk behaviors or increased complaints. Those are all should be red flags for a supervisor out there working with people to, you know, to recognize that this may not just be a one-off event. 
Uh, this person may not just be a, a, an asshole. It might be a real issue. This person may have changed. What are the what are the recommendations you make for people who are, are nervous about having that conversation with their employees? So one of the things I always take a look at um, here in Anaheim, too, is, is an officer by the name of Kevin Sluter, who was a very high achieving employee, you know, was the go getter in patrol, got into a special assignment and something happened to where his life started to spiral out of control. Right. I, I think he was going through a divorce, um, had some back injuries and then started to either drink or utilize, you know, prescription medication, got into a, a DUI and then ultimately end up getting a fire from our department. This was years ago before our peer support program. But I always take a look at, you know, an officer like Kevin that was a very high achieving employee. And then something something happened in his personal life that caused this downward sp spiral. Was there anything that we could have done as, as a city, as a department to help mitigate some of that stuff? But so one of the things too, like, you know, law enforcement is very, there's a very, you know, crazy place right now in regards to everything that we see on TV, you know, all this, you know, politics or this or that, that we are made out to be, you know, the, the bad person. You know, um, when I speak at the conference uh, every year, I always, always say that, you know, that people are targeting us targeting law enforcement simply because of the uniform that we're wearing. So it's causing all these different emotions. And then you have, you know, the, the COVID pandemic and all these different things where, you know, you have an officer trying to do his or her job, make a car stop. And the first thing out of, you know, people's mouth is you don't have the right to do this. And it's just, you know, just because when people call law enforcement, it's not their best day. You know what I mean? Right. Right. <laughs> you know that. So to take all that in and have no release, it's 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 going to come out one one or two ways, right? It's going to come out in a negative situations. It's almost like shaking up a a soda can and then popping the top. It, something's going to happen, and it's nine times out of ten is not good. So when we sit there and, and think about, you know, as a supervisor, I remember going through supervisor class, um, you know, post-mandated class talking about all the supervisors and I talked about police suicide and I sat there and addressed, you know, the, the class. And I said, when I walk away, I don't want you to turn around. So I came back in, in, behind the, the group and I said, I'm officer Smith. I, Sarge, you worked for me for two years. You know me, you saw me. And during my days off, I took my own life. But I had all these red flags, you know, but you never you never talked to me as a person. You never talked to me. The only thing you ever wanted to, to, to know was, was my stats. But you saw, you know, you saw these red flags. How come you didn't have that tough conversation with me? You know, those are the tough conversations that we need to have because one of the things I always say is that, the biggest lie that we tell in law enforcement, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm good. Mm. You know, it's, it's having those tough conversations like, no, I know you're okay, but these are the things that I see. Is there anything that we can do for, for you? But as an agency, sometimes we're so quick at disciplining instead of coming up to the, the root cause of the, of the problem. Hey everyone, I want to take a quick moment to remind you that this episode is sponsored by Com Gear Supply. Com Gear Supply is a leading provider of public safety radios and radio accessories. They have some of the absolute best prices around and their line of duty warranty can't be beat. That's right, on many of their products, if your gear breaks while in the performance of your duties, they'll replace it for you for free. Do you have any idea how many radio headsets I've broken over the years and that I've spent my own money on? Probably close to one every year on patrol. Your radio is important, but accessories you can use mean the difference between a stealthy approach and announcing your presence a block away. We all know the old timer who never wears an earpiece and blows our cover creeping up on a suspect. Don't be that guy. Make sure the gear you're using is high quality and meant to keep you safe in a dangerous career. 
Learn more about ComGear Supply and their line of duty warranty at ComGearSupply.com. And don't forget, their orders are tax-free, and it's also free shipping. They work with individual officers and large departments, so they can meet any need out there. Seriously, their inventory is mind-boggling. Check out ComGearSupply.com and make sure they know you appreciate their support of the show. Use that coupon code THESQUADROOM, all one word, to get 10% off your order. No, yeah, that's so true. You know, I've I've had a few of those conversations, uh, and, and I say, I guess, I was going to say unfortunately, because I've had to have them, but at the same time, I'm glad that I was able to have them with people. And what struck me, you know, coming into that conversation is like, I can walk up on a stranger at three in the morning on a car stop, and I have no problem asking all sorts of uncomfortable, awkward, up you know, up in your face questions about your entire lifestyle and history. However, I have a really hard time doing that with someone I care about and legitimately love. Right. (laughs) And so, and so if we can do that with some suspect on a car stop, we should be able to have the courage to do that with our friends and the people that we care about too. And to me, it goes beyond that. Yeah. Well, what do we do in the hallway all the time? Right. Or, Or you see it in training videos all the time, or there's an OIS, and everyone watches the video. And what's the first thing they ask? Like, you good? Yeah, I'm good. And like, yeah, you're good in that moment. Like, you're not, you're not hurt, right? But that's what we do in the hallway too. Hey, you good? Yeah, I'm good. And we don't, we don't scratch that surface, right? We don't, we accept the the pat answer rather than being like, hey, time out. For real? Like, how are you sleeping? You know, what's your sleep schedule like? Um, you know, hey, you're, you're putting on weight. Everything all right? You know, um, you don't have, you know, um, How's the family? How are your kids doing in school? You know, that that may not be the cause of 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 the trauma. Their kids doing fine in school, but it might open a window into a conversation where they talk about maybe maybe they've got a kid with special needs or maybe they've got challenges with the kids at home and their wife or it opens those conversations. How's your wife doing with you being on night shift? Hey, I know she works, too. This must be hard. You know, connect with those people and ask the deeper questions and they will start to reveal themselves to you and you will start to understand the challenges that that individual faces right we all we all have unique challenges they're not they're not the same for every family so we do it goes back to just being a good leader and knowing your people right and not knowing that oh lorenzo likes to do traffic and garrett likes to do dope and so and so likes to do you know whatever know them on a on a on a level that is beyond the the supervisor know them on the level of, of being their leader, you know? Mm. Uh, but we, but we have to dig into our friends just like we do those people on a traffic stop and, and be okay with whatever answer comes up. You know, um, one thing I found, I don't know if this is true for you too, but they don't expect you to have all the answers either. You don't have to come to them with, Oh, this is the kind of therapy you need to go to, or this is the kind of therapist or that you should do this kind of physical exercise. Like, no, they just, they need to know that someone is out there on their side, that they've got an advocate within the department who's willing to maybe help, you know, if not lead the way, walk with them, you right. know, walk, walk side by side. Cause we, you know, one thing that's been in this, in this current environment where you, you just mentioned where we're constantly second guessed and we're, and it seems like any police action provokes some sort of a civil disturbance. We, we preach this, you know, take care of the person to your left and right, but, but do we really, you know, and, and what can we as individual officers, as individual humans do to really take care of the people to our left and right. And we need to learn from each other, but we also need to understand that some of the things we see have a perfectly legitimate explanation. You know, those, those, those risky behaviors or those things, you know, we, and so that leads me a long walk into the next question, which you mentioned was as departments and discipline, you worked internal affairs. Uh, I have experience in internal affairs. Uh, what are the things that you see agencies doing right or wrong when it comes to, you know, an, an officer screws up, does something that's, you know, good chance it's probably off duty, but there might be some nexus to the department. What are the things that agencies are doing right and wrong when it comes to looking at this uh, this person's history and considering that as part of the discipline process? So I remember meeting a guy um, 
don't remember where. Oh, you know what? I met him during our peer support, our basic peer support class that I met through Nancy, this guy named Alex. And Alex was a former law enforcement officer that um, got into a DUI uh, off duty, ended up losing his job because of it. But when we talked to Alex, Alex said um, he had got into an officer involved shooting where he shot and killed a 15 year old that shot at him, you know, but he struggled with that. And so Alex was the guy that, and Alex would tell you, he was the party animal. You know, he's that guy that he would drink, you know, do crazy things and everybody loved it. Oh, that was just Alex. But Alex was, in his words, compensating for the pain that he was feeling. And so he goes to a um, high school reunion and then he gets into a pretty hellacious um, um, crash, solo vehicle crash, and had some very significant injuries. But like me, all he wanted to do was law enforcement. And so he was told at the time, you know, don't worry about the DUI, get yourself together. You still have a, a job in law enforcement. That's what he was told. And so he's going through his rehab, you know, several months, almost a year. Um, and then he found out that because of his medical condition, he wasn't going to be able to not only be a law enforcement officer, but then he was facing, you know, I don't, I don't think it was felony, but misdemeanor DUI. So he's getting all this news at the same time. So he's sitting at his condo in, in Ontario, drinking. A uh, neighbor calls the police on him because his music's too loud because he's out there, you know, kind of drowning his sorrows with, with, this, with a friend of his. So the cops come out there. Um, he turns it down. They leave. He turns it back up. You know, cops call, call, come back out there a second time, turns it down. They leave third time. Third time, um, and then he hears this from a a sergeant, and the sergeant he overhears this said, "I don't give a I don't give a shit what he's going through. He's getting a citation now." So, in Derek's mind is like, I mean, um, in Alex's mind, he's thinking, "You don't even know what I've been through. You don't know me." And so he gets the citation, and the the sergeant says, "You know what? You need some help." Here's, here's my number. Here's my card. Give me a call. And so they leave. You know, Alex thinks about it for a little bit. Calls the number, and it's a BO number. Starting to give us the wrong number. So now he's even more upset. So he calls over to the PD, and he's on the, uh, he's on the dispatch line. He's talking to a, a, a person that he knows. And the person on the other end is telling him, like, Alex, calm down. Alex is telling him he's on his way over to the, to the PD, you know what I mean? And the dispatcher says, Alex, hang up, call my cell phone. You know, we need to have this conversation. So Alex calls the cell phone, but he's driving over to the PD, right? And so he's over at the PD, rings the, rings because this is after hours, this is like early in the morning, rings the, rings the PD, I want to talk to your watch commander, I want to talk to your watch commander right now. And so... Watch commander calls, comes out, the sergeant comes out, they gave him the, 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 the wrong number, and Alex is upset. Why, are you, why did you give me this number? Why did you give me this number? Derek, I mean, Derek, uh, Alex was probably still drunk at the time, and so they ask him, how did you get here? And so he sees a couple of marked units driving over, and uh, I want to say either the watch commander or the lieutenant at the time or watch commander or the sergeant at the time, end up call, calling his chief, and his chief drove down. And the chief went out to, to breakfast with him and basically told him, like, look, you need to get your life together. Here's here's Dr. Nancy Bull's phone number. I want you to talk to talk to her. And so that kind of, you know, put the, the, the path on Alex on his road to recovery because now he goes and, and talks about what he would he what he went through, but going back to your your original thing about what can departments do, I think that was very courageous of that chief at the time to stop what he was doing, 
to to go out and take his employee to breakfast and have that tough conversation and say, you know what, you need to get your life together because this is what you're leading down a wrong path. Could they have probably did a another DUI? Probably. Yeah. But a lot of times we don't look at the root causes of the problem. We need to, a lot of times we just discipline, discipline, discipline. You know what I mean? So sometimes we need to take a step back and have a different set of eyes and take a look at it, you know, to, to you know, get the, that employee the resources. Not only just because it, it might save their their, life, their their career, That to me that's secondary. It's got to save their life, save their family life. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because I, in my opinion, people will do anything as long as you, you show them they care. You know, I mean, once you show them the care of employees, will people will be able to do anything? It reminds me of a story of we of another guest we have on the show, Nick Metz. Nick was chief of Aurora PD in Colorado, uh, and I think it was in 2019. He had a very, very high profile incident where an on-duty plainclothes detective in morning rush hour crashes uh, his car. No, he didn't crash. He uh, he like passed out at a light. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, of course, in the age of cell phones, everyone's uh, up on the video on it uh-huh. and everyone's recording it. It made the national news. And Nick had the fortitude to 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 not fire the officer for the on duty DUI and and very explicitly told the public, look, he has a problem. And and I'm my job as his chief is to support him and solve this problem that he has that caused the external issue of the DUI, but there's stuff in the background that, that the public doesn't know, but that I, as his chief, I have to go to bat for him and I have to take care of him as a human. And I thought that was one of the most courageous examples of leadership that I've seen. And he took a ton of heat for that. And I even remember at the time that it happened, you know, thinking, well, you know, a that that officer's fired and B, um, when he came out for the officer thinking, wow, that's, I don't know if I would have that same courage to, to, to do that so publicly, you know, cause, cause his response also made national news. So mm-hmm. uh, next story is on another episode. So people can listen to that, but uh, you know, uh, the, the, I challenge sometimes I'm challenged by the, this, this dichotomy that we sometimes have to struggle with, with our job and trying to achieve a work-life balance and how much, how, how much, uh, the brotherhood and sisterhood that we profess to, and that we believe in. And I, I do believe in, uh, also, you know, um, sinks its roots into us, into our off duty activity and our off duty life and how I'm learning after 16 years, more and more, I'm learning anyway, that, some separation is important and, and being able to close the door at the end of the day or at the end of the shift and transition back to, you know, dad, husband, <laughs> you know, baseball coach, whatever it is, uh, is, is becoming more and more important. And I see in young officers, especially, and I was the same way, like you want to spend every waking moment at the, at the PD, you want to spend, you want to sign up for every OT shift because you're having so much fun. And that eventually, I think, becomes one of our distraction techniques, right? We all have the officer who, like, needs the day off, but they're just working seven days straight, and they profess to love it, but they're starting to crack. What are the things you do as a supervisor and a leader in your department to help people create that distance or create that break so that they understand that this isn't who they are as a human, it's what they do? So that's a great question. So one of the things, you know, our peer support teams have been in place for several years now. And so, you know, it might not be those employees, you know, that, that I see. It's now our culture that says, you know, somebody will get a hold of another peer support member and say, you know what, you guys should talk to this person because they're struggling with this or that. You know, and so now we have a culture within our department that that those conversations take place you know still there's a lot of work to be done but i think we are far better now than we had the years past Mm -hmm. but i I think that's a great question because yeah 
Um, and then just telling your own story, you know, me being a, being a you know lieutenant, a lot of, a lot of times just because of the rank, right? People don't want they don't feel comfortable talking with somebody in rank. But it was funny because the day I met Nick back in October, I wasn't even supposed to go to the class. You know what I mean? The training class because there it was it was our peer support training. Um, they had sergeants there. The lieutenant that's uh, over uh, in charge of it was gone. So I said, you know what? I'll go because I wanted to see, the, you know, simple recovery. Um, another location where you could take the first responders out in uh, Costa Mesa and then come back and had an afternoon session with Nick. And I wasn't supposed to sit in. And then uh, Nick was going through his, his presentation. Uh, Derek's picture popped up and I was pretty, you know, open and, and honest about having these conversations. This is a group in, in front of, you know, 15, 20 peer support members that never seen me, you know, in that environment to talk open and, and candid about everything that, you know, not only we went through, but that I went through personally. And when you sit there and talk about some of your experiences, like, you know, I was married for not my second second marriage, but my previous marriage, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to tell my wife things that happen at work. You know what I mean? I want to protect her, but that became the downfall. You know what I mean? Um, and then struggling with now, now it's time to go home, but you don't want to go home because you're so angry, but you don't know what you're angry about. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you're dealing with your kids. You're telling them, you know, when you ride your bike, put your helmet on because you see what happens when, you know, these accidents happen and kids don't have their helmets on and they have these significant brain injuries and this and that. And then when you go home, your kids aren't wearing their, their bikes, their, their helmets, or they're not doing things that, you know, you want to protect them. But when you're, when you were trying to parent, sometimes those, those skills come off as angry, right? But they don't understand yeah. because they're kids. You know? yeah. So, Dealing with all that stuff, um, and 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 being that courageous person that sits there and says, "This is what I went through," because no matter what you know, Lorenzo or Garrett are going through, somebody's going through the same thing. And so when they say, "You know, that person went through it," you know, they're talking about it. Maybe I, I feel better, you know, to go and get some of these resources. Maybe you know what, I might call the counseling team. I might, you know. Um, have my wife or significant other talk to them as, as well, because I think the the biggest piece that is missing, like we, we will give the the officers um, resources, but what about the significant others when they get into a shooting or go through a critical incident and say these are some of the signs and symptoms that that you know your spouse or significant other might be going through because of this, and these are some of the the warning signs. Mm -hmm. to give, you know, the family members those resources as well. And that's what the counseling team does too. Yeah. It's, it's such an, it's such an often forgotten about piece of this whole puzzle is the family, right. And treating, treating the family and vicarious trauma there. Uh, but like you say, just like the interaction, the parenting interaction, you know, what strikes me about your answer right there though is we talk about having the courageous conversation with other people and getting them to talk, you know, and like getting the, the officer who's struggling, get, getting them to tell their story. But um, as, as reluctant as many people are to have that conversation, we're even more so reluctant to tell our own story, right? Like, like, cause then that's real vulnerability that like, it's okay if that person's vulnerable to me and I can help them, but God forbid I share some vulnerability or some emotion or some truth with them because now I'm out there in that uncomfortable zone. Right. But, you know, we are as humans, I think storytelling is, I mean, it is one of the most essential parts of the, it's, it's what makes us human, you know, right up there with a, the opposable thumbs is the ability to teach and tell through story. And it goes back to, you know, sitting around the fire together in, in the iron ages, you know, and, and, the, the Bible is all story and um, all, any religious text is really just story because that's how we teach and we learn. But we have to be able to, as much as we want, talk about having a courageous conversation with others, 
have the courageous ability to tell our own story. And so I think that what you said there is, is absolutely accurate. And in my experience, when someone tells me their story and I connect with that story, I will follow them wherever they want to go. You know, I mean, that I think becomes one of the, 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 the tent posts of leadership uh, for me is when I see someone who wants to, who is willing to tell their own story. Uh, and so I, you know, I have to work hard at it too. Uh, but I, I notice in the people that I follow or the people that I would follow into the fire, it's the people who tell their own story first. And I think that's a lesson for anyone in a supervisory position. Because I say supervisory because I don't equate supervisor supervisor with leader. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you've had that same experience throughout your career. Be anybody has where you might be a supervisor, you might be a manager, but you're not a leader. Right. And anyone in this conversation who's listening today, anybody of any rank, regardless of what's on your collar or on your sleeve, can lead others who are struggling and can lead them towards a better answer than self-medicating or suicide or any of the other myriad of problems that result from trauma. So one of the things I'd love your input on here is, is just reminding people that rank has no, has no play here in your ability to impact another coworker. Correct. You know, one of the things that I that I said to all the team members is that, you know, when we're together as a team, when we're debriefing, I'm just Lorenzo. I'm not Lieutenant Glenn. You know what I mean? Because sometimes that that rank structure will will kind of muddle muddy the waters a little bit. Um, but that's one of the things that I want to make sure that people understand that you know Lorenzo as a person, if that makes sense. Um, but one thing I, I really really wanted to hit home on is that. We always say, you know, law enforcement, we're a family. We're a big family. Welcome to the family until you commit suicide. Then you're no, no longer part of our family anymore. That's something that we, we, we cannot, we, we can't do. I remember talking to um, Derek's uh, ex-wife and daughter on the second year of his passing. And as because I didn't know... Um, that if if Anna had any ill will feelings towards us, it, it, you know, with Anaheim, just because of the circumstances around him, surrounding his death. Um, and I remember, you know, sitting down with her and his daughter and his daughter said this to me. They said, you know what? My dad gave his life to this profession, this organization. And the day that he you know, died, everybody disappeared. Even the best man at his wedding disappeared. You guys talk about family, but when my dad passed, there's nobody there for us. Yeah, we're there probably within a week or two, but as time went on, you know, things kind of faded away. And she asked me why. I didn't have an answer for her. You know, I, I didn't that time we have to take responsibility for the things that we say we're going to do and don't follow up on, you know? And so that really kind of hit home is like, you know, you're absolutely 100% right. I have no, no answer for you, you know, I have no excuses. And those are things that we have to take ownership on. That's so true. Yeah. You know, you, you're, peer support team is, is well placed now in Anaheim and it sounds like the culture has changed where it is not only accepted but an assumed part of the culture which is amazing like that that hill you have to climb to get something like that accepted is a real challenge and there's a lot of agencies that are just starting <laughs> at the bottom of that hill and like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill you know like it's going to take some time and there are other agencies where it is just not even on their radar yet and so that leaves a huge void for officers in, in two ways, the officers that are, that are hurting and the officers who want to do something to help. What is the first step you would recommend for someone who wants to start a peer support team at their agency? Well, one of the things I want to make sure um, is that they don't have to start by themselves. Reach out to, you know, myself, any other agency that has a peer support team. Um, so, um, you don't have to do it by yourself, but I don't want to, you know, forget we, we, we've often talked about, you know, the sworn, 
but the non-sworn are, are going through the same things, you know, dispatchers, you know, that oftentimes don't have the ability to, to, to put the pieces of the puzzle together, right? I remember uh, several of our, of our dispatchers, uh, especially back in 2012, you know, getting calls from all over the, the country, you know, these phone calls yelling at the dispatchers, screaming at them, and they just had to take it, you know, or, you know, this one dispatcher uh, receives a 911 call. This guy is telling the dispatcher he's in the process of killing his mom on the phone. Here's the mom screaming, yelling, you know what I mean? And having to hang up that phone call and then deal with another one, you know? And at one point, one of the dispatchers gets up in the middle of his shift and says, you know, I can't take this shit no more. And then leaves, resigns, you know, and I take a look at like, that's, you know, unfortunate, but that shouldn't happen. You know, I mean, that dispatcher had it up, you know, up to there, you know, just, and it just shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Or crime scene personnel that have to go out and process all these different things or, you know, the records clerks that, that have these, you know, relationship with the officers that see them on a daily day basis that, you know, everybody's going through something, you know, everybody's going through something. We're, we're like you said, we're human, you know, people think we're robots. We train for this. And I sit there and, and tell, you know, people back in, in 2003, one of the hardest things I had to do, um, had a best friend from Westminster PD that was there on the birth of my first two kids, and we became very close. He died um, of an on-duty motorcycle accident. And when his wife called me and met her at the, the hospital and walked in, and I've heard a, a, never heard a woman scream like I've, I heard Robin scream before. And then I knew had, Fred had passed. But the hardest thing I had to do was pull Robin off of Fred and then go home and tell Fred's daughter that daddy wasn't coming home again. So, you know, what kind of training do you receive on, on for that? You know, we're good at saying, okay, Garrett, you know what? We're, you're going to be a homicide detective. I'll send you to homicide school. I'll send you this, this class or this class. But what happens when we're the victims? You know, what happens when we're struggling? What kind of training is there for that? You know, that's why uh, the Concerns of Police Survivors is a great organization that that will come out and assist agencies with uh, line of duty deaths or suicides or anything like that. You know, there's there's training that I think is very beneficial. If anybody's ever had the, the opportunity to see Dr. Kevin Gilmartin speak, it's a, it's a must to read Absolutely. his book. And I sit there and say, if I would have read his book, you know, year one, year three, I'd have been a different father, diff different husband, different law enforcement officer. But now that I have that information, my job is to uh, support those organizations, uh, tell my story, and and assist those officers or organizations that 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 need help, or any agency that that wants to you know a peer support program, you know what to do, what not to do. But my message is, no matter what a, what you're going through as an agency, somebody's already been there, done that, learn from our mistakes. So you don't make the same mistakes over again, because in law enforcement, we got one one chance to do it right. You know, and a lot of times we don't know how to act when we're when it's us involved. We think we know because we say this is how we we treat a homicide scene. We do this and move on and do you know what I mean? But those feelings, those things still exist. Yeah, all great advice. And, and there's there's. A lot of good examples out there, yours included. Crisis Team International is a great resource. Uh, I went through their peer support class with uh, cops with concerns of police survivors and excellent peer support uh, spin up class, to, you know, to get you kind of get you established. And I really want to point out too and appreciate that you, you, you mentioned the dispatchers. You know, there's, there's so much that they deal with. Like you say, like, I, I, I have a tough call and, maybe I have a chance to like pull behind the, the grocery store and just take a breath or, you know, or like get back to the station and, and, and breathe for a minute. Uh, but they don't, you know, they're stuck to that headset and it's one phone call after another. 
And what I found too, they struggle with is like the resolution. You know, they, they have a, they get a call, but then mm-hmm. they never learn the resolution of it. And so there's an anxiety or attention that builds. And I used to work overtime in our dispatch center. And I had, I like that, like your guy who up and quit, like I couldn't do it. It was too <laughs> stressful. It was, I would, I've told many dispatchers this to their face and I'll say it to anybody else. Like I would rather chase a homicide suspect through a dark alley at 3 a.m. than have to work the phones, you know, and have to work con- like the main channel console. Like, no, thank you. Because it is, it is, it is stressful and terrifying. <laughs> and so <laughs> I have so much, so much respect for our dispatchers out there who do that because I no, I don't, I don't say I can't do that job like facetiously. I couldn't do it. I had to walk away. It was too much. So, so thanks for pointing them out. They, they definitely need, uh, need our attention as well. And to be involved. One of the things that we've done, I think is that's important is to bring the dispatchers into the debrief after something like that. And at least that's a start to, to make sure that, you know, I think every dispatch center sits in some dark corner of the, of the station or uh, in a different building sometimes altogether. And we don't see each other enough uh, and having them there at the debrief is, is at least one of those steps. So, you know, Lorenzo, thanks for, for your time today. And you said your job is to tell your story and you've told it here. And I think it's really, really powerful to understand that, um, you know, courageous conversations can be had. Courageous storytelling needs to be done. Um, that peer support programs can be stood up by someone in the middle. It doesn't have, you don't have to wait for the chief to do it. You know, you don't have to wait for a changed admin to do it. Um, it can be, it can be brought up by people who really want to see positive change come about. And so thank you for your time today. And, uh, and I just open it. If there's anything else you'd like to add. No, I'd just like to thank you, uh, for the work that you're doing, you know, Nick, you know, very powerful uh, person um, that's out there, you know, telling his story and and reaching a lot of people, and so that I think that's what what needs to be done, you know, so we can start, you know, having that pendulum swing the other way, in, in terms of officers, you know, um, receiving the resources that that we need, you know, dispatchers, everybody, you know, because this is a, a significant time in law enforcement that I sit there and, and say that although a lot of people are leaving the, the profession, these these are times when um, leadership re- really needs to, to step up because we, we have an opportunity um, to change our profession. Mm, you know, that right there, we have, we have an opportunity. You know, we, it's not, I mean, it is an obligation, but it's not a, it's not a chore. It's not a, um, it's not something to dismiss. It's an opportunity. There's a positive impact there with the idea that it's an opportunity. You know, I like that. And we'll, I think that's the best place to end. So Lorenzo, thanks for being with us today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening to this interview with Lorenzo Glenn, the president of the Public Safety Peer Support Association, lieutenant with Anaheim PD. Really appreciate his authenticity and his uh, willingness to just be open about the lessons he had to learn the hard way about how some employees are just uh, just need, need I don't know if it's need more effort uh, if that's even possible, but how we can be more mindful of of our coworkers, you know. And as I often do at the ends of these episodes, I I com- I think back about the conversation through that lens of badges, beliefs, actions, discipline, goals, emotions, and service, and how we, uh, how we sometimes, you know, treat the idea of peer support, or we treat the idea of helping a partner, or we treat the idea of having to extend ourselves to maybe have an uncomfortable conversation, have a difficult conversation with someone, and how we often shirk from those things. But our beliefs around um, for me, I think in this episode, really the idea of, of that B in badges and beliefs is, you know, are you someone who believes that we can help each other and that we are truly teammates? We are truly a family, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, or is the overriding belief that you have to be a tough guy or a tough girl all the time and we can't drop that persona to, to help a partner? You know, and, and if, if it's that, that belief is going to hinder and get in the way 
of doing a lot of important stuff for for our teammates, for our family. You know, and then actions. Just having the courage to act upon the concerns you might have about someone else, the courage to to act upon uh, uh, you know, confronting them and asking them, <clears throat> not just, hey, you good, but really, really digging into what may be there, what, what's, what might be bothering them. You know, when we ask, just like when you pass over the hall, hey, how you doing? We don't expect someone to tell us the truth. We don't want people to tell us the truth. It's a, it's a social nicety. It's a social custom we use. And when someone actually says something that's truthful, it throws us off. We get annoyed. So, you know, after a critical incident, we all look at each other. You good? You good? The implied uh, issue there is that we're expecting them to say yes, you know? So act upon the, the, the need or act upon your concerns about somebody, but really get into it. Don't just take a surface level answer. Discipline. In badges, that's just the discipline to stay aware of how our coworkers, how our, uh, if you're of someone of a supervisory rank, how our subordinates are acting, how they're engaging or how they're withdrawing, uh, the discipline to put yourself in the position to be the person who starts the conversation, the difficult conversation. You know, our goals, our goal should always be that everybody goes home and that the fight uh, to survive shouldn't have to extend to the off-duty hours. You know, that should be our goal as a group. That when you leave, when you take off the uniform, when you take off the vest and the gun belt, that you're not left fighting something else by yourself. And that should be our goal. And uh, and that's how I think this relates to badges here. Emotions. So many things about emotions in something like this with a, an officer-involved suicide or or finding someone or confronting someone who's struggling. But uh, not only their emotions, which are scary or can be scary, and we all, you know, type A's, we all get a little weird about emotions in general, but also our own and acknowledging that our own emotions might be preventing us from having this conversation, either because we share something similar or we have, we don't want to admit that we also might feel that same way, but also we also might just be scared to handle someone else's emotions because we're not prepared for it. You know, and then service, that S in badges, that's an obvious one. When we serve our partners best, we serve our agencies best, we serve our communities best, when we're looking out for each other, when we're checking in on each other, when we truly make this a family, we truly make this a brotherhood or sisterhood, we don't just give it lip service, but we really serve them by by being a, a beacon of hope, by being uh, someone who's encouraging, by being someone who is on their team. So that's how I think badges relates to this conversation with Lorenzo. All right, I want to offer you something I'm very excited about right before we go. It's absolutely free. We're la- we've launched Tactical Tuesdays, a free weekly email that uh, will bring you a few tactics, a couple of tips, some strategies to help you succeed in the week ahead. Maybe a book I want to share, gear I found useful, an inspiring quote, or just anything else I think you'd like. To sign up for the Tactical Tuesdays email list, you can visit thesquadroom.net forward slash Tactical Tuesdays. Or just text your email address to 805-364-2331. That's 805-364-2331. If you didn't catch that, check out the show notes below for this episode. You'll find it there. And I promise we won't sell or spam your email address. Before we wrap up, I want to chal- I have a challenge for you. If you got something out of this episode, if you're inspired by this conversation with Lorenzo, I want to challenge you right now to take a photo of your podcast player as this episode's playing. And I want you to share it with three people. People who you think need to hear this and hear what we talked about today. Maybe they're members of your peer support team. Maybe there's someone who you've been thinking about, uh, someone who needs to be uh, connected with. But send them this episode and recommend that they listen to it. Also, please consider leaving a review on the podcast player of your choice. Also, please, if you can, if you have a couple extra seconds, leave a comment with your review. It really helps us understand what people get out of the show, what they uh, value, and it also helps uh, more people learn about the show. And it brings more people to this cause uh, that we're trying to to push forward. And of course, join us on Instagram at the Squad Room and our Facebook group, the Squad Room Group. Special thanks to our sponsors for today's episode, Hard to Kill Fitness. If you're looking for an effective, challenging at home workout program that can get you results and get you back in shape, check them out at hardtokillfitness.co. And a special thanks to our sponsor, other sponsor, Com Gear Supply. 
If you're looking for the best prices and industry-leading warranty coverage on your radio equipment, make sure you check them out and use the coupon code the Squad Room to get 10% off your order. There are other great companies that support the show and support you as well. Go to thesquadroom.net forward slash support to see exclusive deals for many, many others. All right, until next time, take care of each other and stay safe.